Well, this past week, if you saw the news, you saw that there was a history made as two women spacewalked together for the first time in history, that, that it was a, 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 ma- a woman mission that went out of our uh, spacecraft, that they spacewalked for, I believe it was seven hours, that they were outside working. Now, that, now that's a day's work, right? You know, that, you know it, was, it was a routine mission. I don't know if there's anything routine about what those ladies did, but, but I, I just you know, was enthralled by that thought that they were out there for seven hours working on uh, whatever it was that they were working on. And I would just like to hope that they, they, in that seven hours, they had an opportunity to just turn and look, right? To just to bestow earth and, and all that God has created, to look out and just to really, you know, capture all of that, what that must be like, you know, to d- just have nothing else around you and just to see all of God's creation in, you know, in its entirety of what we know and then to look out in space and to know that there's far, even far more that he's created it has to be an amazing thought, you know, that, that God of all creation, uh, you know, that, that as we sing those words, that, you know, just an amazing to think of the one that we sing about, you know, and when he moves and when he, when he acts, it's always a very powerful thing. And when you experience it, it's one of those things that, you know, you just, you always remember. And, and, and sometimes you don't know what to do afterwards. You know, there's just these moments in your life. I remember in uh, 1998 and the summer of 98, I was in Mexico and I was traveling with a uh, youth group. I was a, a part of the leadership there. And, and uh, we had uh, these kids, and we were doing VBSs throughout uh, Mexico. And, and at one of the churches, it was a Sunday evening. And on that morning, they have Sunday school. And in the evening, they have their service. And so uh, what we would have, be doing right now, they do that on Sunday nights. And, and so that morning, we had met with the kids, and then we had gone to lunch. And at lunch, one of the... Um, the people from that church, they asked our interpreter something, and you could tell that there was a confusion there, and he was asking questions back and forth, and then he steps on the bus, and, and he whispers to our main leader, and our main leader whispers back, and, and then they turned to the, us, as the, those who were sitting in the, in the bus, and they said, guys, we've, we've got an issue. It's not, you know, it's not a bad issue, but, but they're expecting someone to preach tonight at their service, and we hadn't planned on that. And so who wants to speak? <laughs> And I was the only one who was in Bible college at that time that, you know, that, that everyone just kind of looked and like, well, I guess that's you. And I'm like, well, why does that have to be me? You know, and, and um, but it's like a pastor going to your house, you know, for, for dinner, like he's probably going to pray. You know, it's like one of those moments. And, and so I, I remember I was just, I was so scared to death because I, I didn't know, I hadn't preached very much and I didn't really know what to say. And so I just began to, to leaf through my Bible and to flip through and I'm like, Lord, what will you have me say? And everyone's eating lunch. I can't even focus on, I couldn't eat. I was too nervous, you know, and, and because I'd never spoken with a translator, none of that stuff before. And, and so I, I found this very simple passage that I thought, you know, this, this is a very uh, just basic, you know, this, this is the word. And, and I've got it written down. It's, it's found in Mark. And, and it's just a simple passage. And, and I went up that night and we got up there and the translator comes up and I'm looking at him because I, I was just, you know, I'd seen it done, but I'd never done it. And so I start to speak and, and I'm quick, you know, like I normally am. And, and he's like, slow down, you know, and, he, and he's trying to translate. And so then I'm having to talk and then I'd look at him and he would say something. I look back at them and you know, it was just this, this very unorthodox, very not smooth sermon. And but yet you could begin to feel God moving as we were speaking and and. And maybe he was, I mean, I don't know what he was saying, so it may have just been really good stuff, but what I was saying just didn't seem like that impressive, you know, and, 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 but it was, it was the gospel message, and what I've learned from that day is that the gospel never returns void, and I don't care how simple the presentation is, that when God's spirit is there, and it's, it's, it's alive, and it's well, and there's people who are hungry for the word of God, you can take the simplest things, you know, fish and loaves. You can take the simplest things, you know, just, just a, a, a small message, and God will make it so much more than it could ever be on its own. And we called for an altar call, and, and people just started coming, and, 
And I went down to pray, and, and I, you know, the, everyone's praying in Spanish. I don't even know what I was thinking. Like, I went down, I'm trying to talk, like, what can I pray for you about? And they're just looking at me like, I don't know what you're saying, you know. And, and, and so I just started praying over them, and they're praying, and everyone's praying together, and, and it's just this mixture of English and Spanish. And, and I get up, and, it's, you know, people can't get to the altar. So, so there's just like, you know, there's people kneeling at the altar, and then there's those kneeling behind them, and then there's those kneeling behind them. It's just as close as people could get to the front, and it was just this amazing moment and I got done and and I just I had to find a place just to to get by myself because I really didn't understand Lord what was that and that was amazing but but how do you define that and I and I mean I know it wasn't my words because they and just the the reality that God had moved you know in my ministry there's been moments like that where you get done and you just think I I, I don't even know what to do i don't even know what to say you know last week we had a very powerful experience together and i got left i'm like i didn't i for for a couple days i just said lord what, where do we go from there you know like like you know because that was the end of our series and so like what's our next series you know and i and i think we oftentimes we get in that mode of just kind of rushing to the next thing and, and, we, and we, I mean, it can be a, a very powerful moment or a very mundane moment. And, and we don't care. We're just ready to go on to the next thing. And I, and I couldn't go on to the next thing. This whole week, I really struggled. And, and I really wasn't sure, God, where would you have us to go? And I, I couldn't find clarity on that. I, I couldn't really. And, and, and I just began to think, you know, I, 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 Hill, I, I had to admit, I laughed at your comment. You know, you know, Hill commented about our service. And he said he got in the car and he turned to Pam. And he said, what was that? God showed up. You know, it's just like this amazing, amazing thing. I love that description of it. What was that? And because that's the way it feels at times. When, when God really moves and when he's moved in your heart, sometimes we, don't, we just don't know what to do with it. And this morning as I was thinking about that, I, I just thought, you know, what do you do after the fire falls? Because when the fire falls, it's this amazing moment. And it's a very impactful moment. But what do you do after that? That, that's such a powerful time, and, and sometimes we don't know what to do. And, and I want to draw upon a very familiar passage of Scripture if you grew up in church. If you didn't grow up in church, I want to catch you up to this story. But it, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 18. It's, it's the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And, and if, you, if you know this story, and, and I've preached on this story many times, but, but you know, Elijah has, has basically called out the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Asherah, and there's, there's 850 prophets total, 450 for the prophets of Baal, 400 for the prophets of Asherah. And he's, and he's basically had this God showdown to where he, he's going to call upon his God, the true God, and they're going to call upon Baal. And whoever's gods can, can light the fire on top of this mountain, then that's going to be the God. And everyone's going to proclaim that that's the God. And, and it was really this... Um, confrontation because the, the god of Baal was the god of, of weather and, and most depictions have him holding a, a, a lightning bolt and so it was almost this idea that we're going to get on your territory and we're going to show you how powerful my god is and, and because even he's you know, on your home field advantage he's going to show up and your god won't be present and it's exactly what takes place that, that the prophets of Baal pray all day nothing happens no no fire in the sky, nothing, uh, not even, you know, a, a, a singe on the offering. And then Elijah gets up and he, and he prays this very simple prayer that's found in 1 Kings 18. And as he prays this prayer, God answers in a very powerful way. In fact, as they were building the altar three, three times, he had them pour four huge um, uh, containers of water over the altar. And it, you know, scripture says it, it ran down and it began to form a pool around the altar. And, and we all know how, how much of a pain it is to try to get wood to light when it's wet. And, and I mean, it was just this, this over and above to show that, that God was going to be God. And Elijah prays in this very simple manner, very direct manner, and God answers. And in 1 Kings 18, 38, we pick up and it says this, The fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, <laughs> and also licked up the water in the trench. 
Verse 39, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. It was obvious in that moment that something very amazing had happened, that God had shown up. And, and in that moment, everyone that was there, they fell prostrate, which means that they were flat on the ground, face down on the ground, and that all that they could cry was that the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So, so in that moment, the, as the fire falls, and this is one thing that I've noticed every time I've seen the fire of God come into a group of people, and the fire of God come into a situation, is that in that moment... There is clarity. That when God moves, there is clarity among those that are there. It's not confusion. Because God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of disorder. He is a God of peace. And there's this moment of clarity that, man, God is, is here. God is moving. And in that moment of clarity, oftentimes what can happen is that, that we know not only that God has moved in a, a location or that he's moved among a people, we know that he's moved in our hearts. And we also know that, that what he's spoken to us, and, and, and if you've been saved, you, you know this idea that, that is, you've heard the gospel preach and that, that your sin, I mean, just kind of welled up inside of you and you knew that, that you had sin in your life, that you needed to be forgiven, and that there's one now who says that he will forgive you, that he will pay the penalty of your sins. But there was, I mean, there's, there's no denying that the sin that's there and that your need for forgiveness is this, this reality, that, that this clarity that, that we all have, have experienced if, you, if you've become a believer in Jesus Christ. If you've, if you've been in those moments, you know in those moments that as God moves, there's oftentimes a conviction that moves alongside with it. That, that as God moves in your life or as he moves in a moment that there's this clarity of the things in your life that don't look like God. And that you need to do business with. You ever felt that moment? I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's so clear to you. And no one even has to preach on it. You don't have to like have a list and go, okay, guys, we're going to get the sins out. You know, and, and when I call your name, you stand up. That's your sin. You know, you don't have, no one has to do that. Because the Holy Spirit convicts and it brings it to your mind with such clarity. And that often comes alongside of a move of God. Why does that take place? I believe it's because God is holy. And that when there's a great move of God, there's a holiness that begins to come in that convicts the sin that's in the room. And as Elijah experienced on top of a mountain, I believe many people have experienced, no matter the location, no matter the size of people, that when God moves, there's a clarity. So what did they they do in the clarity? Well, well, here's what they did. Elijah 1840. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and, and slaughtered there. Now that seems very brutal. If you've never read that passage before, it may be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a man of God and he's calling for these things. I mean, that, that, that's pretty extreme. I mean, he, he, he just won the, the war, right? Why does he have to go this extra step? Well, the, the reason why he had this go this extra step is because the New Testament says, those of us who know the good we ought to do and don't do it, sins. And Elijah, as a man of God, he knew the word of God. And here's what the word of God had told them in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 and following. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder... And if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. Verse 5, that prophet or dreamer must be put to death for inciting rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. That prophet or dreamer tried to turn you away from the way of the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. You see, Elijah knew that scripture, but what he also knew is that the people of Israel had allowed the prophets of Baal to begin to infiltrate the camp, and now all of a sudden, not only was there worship towards God, but there was also worship towards Baal, and there was these Asherah poles that were being erected, and everything that God had told them not to allow to happen, they had allowed to happen by not taking care of what God had said to take care of. And so in this moment, in the moment of clarity, 
God reminds the people of what God, or Elijah had reminded the people of what God had told them many years before. That if there are those who spring up around you and they're trying to get you to a foreign God, they're trying to, to persuade you by their causes and by their actions, sometimes even by their quote-unquote miracles, that, that when you, there's that taking place, you need to purge them from the camp. Because they will not only lead you astray, they will lead all of God's people astray. And in the moment of clarity, the people laugh. They obey the word of the Lord. You see, that's what happens and what should happen when we have moves of God within our midst is that when the clarity comes, it should drive us to action. And and for Elijah, he was reminded of what God had called them to do. And now he finally has everyone's attention. Have you ever tried to get everyone's attention? It's not always easy. Now, some of you have been gifted with a very special thing. You can whistle. I, I never could whistle, right? I mean, you can whistle, and you could do it right now, and everyone would jump, right? Because, I mean, when you whistle, it gets everyone's attention. I never could do that. I always envied that, to be honest. And I've tried privately to learn, and it's sad. It's pitiful, all right? Some of you have very booming voices. Some of you had this teacher voice or a mom voice, and, and you know, sometimes it's a dad voice, and when you yell, everyone stops. I wasn't gifted with that either. You know, when I, when I yell, now my kids, you know, I think it's special with your kids, like you can get, you know, loud and your kids listen. No one else beside my kids listen. You know, like no, one, no one's listening to my dad voice except my kids. And, uh, and so some of you have that. And so you know what it's like when you're trying to get everyone's attention and no one seems to be paying attention. And for Elijah, this was the case. He'd been trying to help people understand the problems and what was taking place within Israel, and no one was paying attention. In fact, they they were ignoring him. But in this moment of clarity, because of a movement of God, now all of a sudden everyone's listening. And he commands them to do what God had commanded them to do. You know, Philip Harrelson, a pastor, he said this, and I, I believe it's so true. He said, what we want to survive reveals the whole allegiance of our heart. What we want to survive reveals the whole allegiance of our heart. Had the people said, no, 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 uh, uh, Elijah, I mean, that, that's, I mean, I'm sure that sounds like a good idea, but you know what, that, that seems a little bit too brutal for us. And so, so you know, let's just kind of all live in harmony here. It would really understand the allegiance of the heart is that even though God has called us to do this, we think our way is better. And we see the same thing happen daily in our lives. God moves in our midst. There's clarity. But instead of action, we begin to compromise. And we know exactly what God has called us to do. But, but, but what God has called us to do is going to require us to do something that, you know what, we're just not quite comfortable or ready to do yet. And so we begin to compromise. You see this very thing happen with King Saul. A few weeks ago, we talked about Saul and David. Well, with Saul and David, one of the things that, that got Saul in so much trouble with the Lord is that God had given him a command. That as they were facing the enemy, the one who had been against Israel, the one who had, had all, gone along the sides of Israel, this story is, is in Scripture, it's just amazing the brutality of some of the people in which they faced. But as, as the group of Israel were going, some of the men from this tribe, they would come along the outskirts and the, and the young and the elderly, they would pick off because they were easy to pick off. And they would kill them as they were en route. And it began to anger the Lord. And as as Saul is is given the orders to confront this kingdom, he's told to to wipe out the kingdom. And in this clarity of God, Saul chooses to compromise. And he doesn't. In fact, even the very king of the other kingdom, he spares and he has with him. Now, they plundered the kingdom and they, they take all the resources of the kingdom, but they haven't done what God has called them to do. And there's compromise in their midst and Saul pays the price for it. And so in this moment, Elijah is helping the people understand not just what God has done and that we're to praise him, but in the midst of the move of God to act with clarity. 
You see Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 8 tells us what that looks like in our lives today. As we experience moves of God and as clarity begins to come into our life, here's what Colossians says, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such of the things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. You see, when there's clarity and when God has spoken with clarity and he's moved in a great move of God, in that clarity, we're to act on it. And what God is calling us to act on, I believe, as the New Testament church, he's saying, look, I want you to put to death some things. Just as I called these men and women to put to death the enemies of God, I'm calling you to put to death the enemy of God, which is our fleshly self. And it's the acts that in which we do. So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he begins to list and helps us understand. And then we have a choice. Either we act in the midst of the clarity or we choose to compromise. And oftentimes what happens is we choose to compromise. Because as we look at the things that God is calling us to put to death, some of those things we kind of still like. And I'm sure it's why when Saul was faced with the situation he was faced in, when the men and women of God were oftentimes over the years faced with the situation that they were faced with, it seemed much easier to almost obey than to fully obey. And church, I think we struggle with that today. I think at times I struggle with that. That it's not that God hasn't been clear. And and it's not that he hasn't moved. It's that in the clarity, what he's asked me to do, I'm just not really ready to do that yet. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. You see, one thing I've learned is that as great moves of God happen, we oftentimes want to stay there. I mean, there really was a temptation. As I was going through this week, I just thought, man, how do we create that? <laughs> I mean, that was awesome. How do we, how do we get that again? You know, and, and I, I'm reminded of the story of, of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration where, where he brings up the three disciples. And, and as they're up there, you know, they don't know what to do because there's this great moment of worship. And, you know, let's build, you know, houses here, one for, one for everybody. And, and we can just stay up here on the mountain and... Jesus just kind of dismisses that idea like, no, you, you know, that's sweet, but, but that's not what we're here to do. And you've got to come off the mountain at times. And sometimes you have to walk through the valleys. And even though we would rather stay on the mountain, the truth is that, that as we go through the valleys, oftentimes the lessons that we learn and the relationship that we rely upon with our Heavenly Father, it goes so much deeper in times of valleys than it ever does on mountaintops. And we learn more about who God is and who he's called us to be. And we have actual act, opportunities to put those things into action. Now, I love mountaintops. I love moments like last week. I believe that they can happen more as people of God just submit and humbly submit themselves to the Lord. When we lay down what we think everything that everyone else is going to think and we just care about him and what he desires in our life. 
when we're more concerned with the things of God than we, when we are the things of ourselves, and when, when, when we gather together as a church, we're not constantly looking at our watch, but we're just looking around at one another and saying, you know, who, who, who here needs to hear from God? Who here can I pray for? Who here can I help? I believe when we begin to walk with that mindset, it's amazing how much more often the mountaintops show up in our life. But the reality is we all have to come down and we all have to walk through valleys. And so we weren't made for the mountaintop in this world. But it's these great moments of clarity that in the clarity we can have the opportunity to act. And scripture says to lay down every weight and sin which does so easily entangle and to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, when I hear that phrase... The older I get, the more true that phrase rings. People always tell you, you know, life's not a sprint, it's a marathon. There's wisdom in that. I remember in track, that I used to love to run some of the distance races. And, and the, the first race that kind of went from sprint to distance was the, um, the 400. And it was one, one time around the track. I mean, you had the 100, which was one stretch. You had the, the 200, which was half of the track. And then you had the 300 hurdles, which is three quarters of the way. And then you had the 400 meter dash, which was the, the full length of the track. And I'll never forget Arthur. <laughs> In eighth grade, Arthur was, a, was a, a good friend of mine, good buddy. And Arthur was a phenomenal 100 meter runner. I mean, he was fast. And I'll never forget, he just wanted to run the 400 so bad. I don't know the reasoning why, but boy, he just really wanted to run it. And he finally got coached to put him in the 400-meter dash. And he lined up on the line, and, and there was a, a whole row of kids. And, and he gets up there, and boy, he's, I mean, he just looks ready. And he takes off, the gun fires, and he goes. And for the first 100 meters, no one was even close to Arthur. For the second 100 meters... I mean, it was, it was just clear that Arthur was going to win this thing running away. The next 300 meters, people had begun to close the gap. With about 350 meters to go, everyone had passed Arthur, and Arthur, we were very scared, wasn't going to make it to the finish line. <laughs> the last 50 meters was the hardest thing I've ever watched someone go through because I don't know how much energy Arthur had exerted. It was obviously all of it. But by the time he got to the line, and I, and I kid you not, and I've told Elijah this, we've laughed at this many times, I mean, Arthur just kept me, he could barely, he barely move. He was just, it was like someone, had, like, Arthur had ran a marathon, and now he's at the end, but all he had run was one lap. But he had exerted all of his energy, all of his effort into this moment. And as he gets to the finish line, I mean, his legs, you know, when you've seen a runner where they just can't even hold up their legs anymore, he just collapsed over the finish line. And, 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 and after we got done laughing, we ran and we grabbed Arthur, and we picked him up and we made sure he was okay, but I mean, it was just so comical. And we tried to get him. We said, Arthur, I mean, didn't you know? He said, well, I thought I could make it. <laughs> I thought I could make it. You know, when I look at our spiritual life and I want to hear the words of the writer in Hebrews that, that we're to run with perseverance, what it helps me to understand is that, is that we're to pace ourselves in this thing called life. And that we enjoy the, the great movements of God. But even in the absence of the great movements of God, we know that God is still present and that he is still alive. And we're called to keep moving and to keep walking and to not just sit down and wait till the next movement of God and then get up and move. But it's the faithful believer who understands that, that the God who is powerfully present in the midst of a service, the God who is there when we have goosebumps, is the same God who is there when we're by ourselves and we're crying in our bedroom and we just don't know how we're going to go on and we're just asking God to just, please, would you just show me a little bit of what you want me to do and who you want me to be? God, would you give a blessing because I just don't know if I can make it anymore? Same God. Same God. He hasn't left us or forsaken us, but he's there with us in the midst of it. And you see, when we, when we begin to believe the lies of the enemy, we can believe that, that God is here when, when, when there's a powerful sermon, or God is here when there's a, a song that we really like, or God is here when we get goosebumps, but he's not there with us when we're by ourselves and we're just wondering, is this all real? And the enemy can easily begin to whisper into our life, 
and to try to get us to doubt the power, the magnificence, the love, and the grace of a Savior. The author says to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. I don't know what that looks like in your life, but the more I talk with people and, and the more I have weeks like I had last week where I just made a simple Facebook post and asked folks for prayer and people begin to pour out their hearts in private message and comments, I, the more I just realize that, you know what, just people, they just need, they need God in their life. They, they need Him to show up in, in this very specific ways and they're all going through different things and some of them are just so heartbreaking and some of them you've gone through yourself and you think, you know what, I know, I know what that feels like but it's going to get better and others of them you think, man, I don't even know how to respond to that situation. It just seems so difficult and you just pray for the peace that only God can bring because it's not wisdom from you that's going to help that situation and you just realize all of these people that are hurting and you understand why God said to go into all the world and make disciples. And why he didn't just grab 12 guys and say, you guys, I want you to go into all the world. But, but, but he calls all of us as believers of Jesus Christ to go into all of the world because here's what I know. My friends are not your friends. And if my friends are hurting like that, I know your friends are hurting like that. And if my friends need prayer, guess what? Your friends need prayer. And maybe your friends are just waiting for someone to say, hey, how can I pray for you? Not because I'm special, but because I believe in a God who answers prayer. And I believe he desires a relationship with each and every one of us. And I know what it's like when you just feel like, like there's no one who cares and then that you just don't know how it's going to happen. I know what that feels like. And I just want you to know that you're not alone and that there's someone here with you who actually cares and who's not just caring because maybe they can get something from you, but I'm just caring with no strings attached and I'm just asking you, how can I pray? And how can we intercede on, to God on your behalf? What a powerful thing. If the people of God in those moments of clarity that they begin to act on what they knew that God was calling them to do first personally and then amongst others. You know, as I was reading I came across Romans 6 chapter, uh, chapter 6 verse 12 through 14 it says therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Paul says to the church in Romans that, that, that you know, as we give our lives to Jesus Christ, that, that now we have a new master over our life and it's not sin any longer. But by the grace and the mercy of God, it's him. And so why would we use our bodies for our old master? Why would we not submit it to our new master who is Christ? He is our Lord. He's our Savior. And not to let sin reign in our mortal body. And not to obey its evil desires. And not to offer any part of ourselves as an instrument of wickedness, but rather to God as those who have been brought from death to life. I mean, think about it, church, that as, as, as men and women of God, that, that we're not our own, that we've been bought with a price. And so while we would allow ourselves to be used by the enemy is beyond me, but I understand the temptation. And I know why we struggle. And I know why when God says in the clarity, I want you to put it to death. And it's not just by, by words and by this mysterious voice, but, we, but by his word, that as we read his word. I mean, it can't get much clearer, can it? Put to death the evil deeds of the body. Well, I, I, it would be nice if I knew what those deeds were. Well, here's what they are. And he begins to list them for us. <laughs> and he shows us in the clarity of what we're to do. But you see, what we have to wrestle with, are we going to be fully obedient in the clarity? Or are we going to compromise the, the, the clarity that God has given to our life? And just do half of it. Or just do one or two things. Or just to do all of them but one, and I kind of like this one, so I'm going to keep it to myself for a little while. No one knows, no one has to know. 
but this is just mine. Why not just give everything over to him? He said, I I would love to. I just don't know how to do that. Well, he's promised to help us through the power of his Holy Spirit. And and I believe that he helps us by by, by sharpening every one of us. That as, as, you know, Scripture says that if you see a a, a speck in your brother's eye, to remove the plank in your own eye first, and then, then you can help him. Now get what all is taking place. One, that we typically have something in our life that needs to be removed. And I believe that's what God does, that he continues to show us things in our life that are not like him that need to be removed. And they first start out pretty big, do they not? I mean, sometimes when we first come to Christ, it's very easy to pick out these things because we know that they're wrong. We didn't even need God to tell us they're wrong. We knew they were wrong when we were doing them. And so those are the very easy things that we pick out. But the longer I'm a believer, the more he just kind of begins to peel back layer after layer after layer and shows me areas in my heart that just don't look like him. Those areas of anger, those areas of pride, those areas of bitterness, those things that that he begins to peel back and he just says, right right here, son, that doesn't look like me. I want you to to remove that. I'm going to do it, but you have to give me permission. You have to allow me into your life. And as we allow God to move in our life, what a wonderful gift that he's given us brothers and sisters in Christ who can come alongside and sharpen us. But here's the thing. We have to find someone we can be vulnerable with, do we not? I mean, it's hard for you to keep me accountable on something that you don't know of. And so I'm not saying that we have to go and we have to tell everyone everything that's going on in our life, but what I'm saying is that don't allow the enemy to convince you that you should keep these things private. Because there's something powerful when we expose this sin to the light. And we'll ask others to come alongside of us in this journey. And we begin to not only pray and ask God to remove it, but we have others interceding on our behalf. There's a powerful thing that takes place. And I believe it leads to victory in the lives of believers. As God has moved... What did he tell you in the clarity? You know, if you were here last week, in in the midst of that moment, in the midst of those prayers, what was it that God was doing in your heart that you, you said, you know what, I know exactly what I need to do? You know, I I know exactly who I need to call. You know, God, I, I get it. I've been running from this a long time, and, and I know, I know that, that this isn't right. And I need it out of my life. In that moment of clarity, what, what was it for you? M- maybe you weren't here last week. M- maybe God has, has allowed us just a moment of clarity in our life this morning. What would we write down? What, what would we say, God, God I get it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I've tried to be obedient, but, but I, I'm, to be honest, I've just been compromising. I mean, I know what your word says. It's not that I don't know what your word says. It's the reality that I just don't want to do it because I like it. I think it's better than what you have to offer. And isn't that where we come down? When we cling on things tighter than what we cling on to God, isn't what we're saying in our heart is that I think what I have is better than you? I think what you're offering is good, but I think what I have and what I get to experience is better. And in the moment of clarity, maybe you just hear God whispering to you, just trust me. Just trust me. Last week we closed with a question, and I want to close with that question again. Because I know that many of you may be wrestling with that idea and just thinking, boy, I just, I just don't know. Whatever it is that, that God has showed you in the clarity, you're just, I'm just not quite sure. One, if you can do it, even if you wanted to. Or two, if you really even want to. And the question that we said last week, I, th- I believe it has to be the question for us this morning. If you're not willing to give up everything for Christ... Are you willing 
to be made willing. Maybe you can't just lay it in an altar and say, you know what, God, it's yours. I'm done with it. Maybe for whatever reason, and we all have our different reasons, maybe for whatever reason, you just can't lay it down and just say, God, in the clarity of the moment, I not only know what you're asking me to do, I'm going to do it. Just like the, the people on Mount Carmel, God, I, we knew what you were going to do, and we, and we knew what you told us to do through the prophet Elijah, and we did it. And we should have did it long ago, but God, we, we're going to do it now. And for us today, maybe we just hear with the clarity, God, we know what we're supposed to do. And we should have done it long ago. But God, past is in the past. We're, we've got today, and we're going to do it today. And if we can't say that, would, would you just at least be willing to say, God, would you make me willing? Lord, you and I both know I'm just not willing yet, but God, I'm, I'm open to you making me willing. Would you soften my heart? Would you do something in my life? God, God would you give me the strength? Would you give me the power to do that which I just feel like I cannot do in this moment? Would you pray that prayer? Won't you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, Lord, I pray that for all of us that are here. Lord, that your word would speak clearly to us today. Lord, we experienced a great mountaintop experience, but God, I, I know. Lord, in the midst of that, you had to have spoken to people. There was clarity in the midst of the movement of God. And so, Lord, what have we done with the clarity? Have we compromised it or have we acted on it? Lord, today, there may be those of us here today that we weren't there last week. God, we don't even know what, what everyone's talking about. But Lord, it just seems very clear to us that the things that we've been wrestling with, Lord, it's almost as though you, you've, you've been tailoring this for us in this moment. And so God, in the moment of clarity, are we going to do what you've called us to do? Or are we going to compromise once again. Lord, my prayer is that we would act. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that just doesn't feel like they have the strength to act, that they would be bold enough, daring enough, because it's a dangerous prayer, to pray the prayer. Lord, would you make me willing? God, would you make me willing? Lord, I want to be or whatever it is that keeps me from doing it, or whatever it is that's kept me this past year, this past month, God, the, the, for years, God, whatever it is, Lord, I want to just give it all to you. I just don't know if I can. Lord, would you make us willing today? And then would you move in a way that only you can? In a way that when we look back, we would realize, God, you were moving in our life. And you chose the words that we needed to hear. And God, you brought clarity to the moment. Lord, I pray that you would be with us now. Speak to us now. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand for this morning with me. Maybe today is a time of response. You... Maybe some of you are writers, and maybe in the clarity of the moment, maybe you just need to write down what it is that God's telling you to do. You know, Psalm 139, the psalmist says to, to search me, O God, to, to know my heart. And I love that psalm. You know, if you, if you take time, I almost had us conclude with that psalm today just to read through it together because it, it's almost as a, a prayer to God. Because as you read through those things, it just helps you to begin to realize how much He loves you, that how much He's known you from the very beginning, that He knit you together in your mother's womb. Just all amazing thoughts, especially in our climate today. But that's the God that we serve and the one who loves us to such a degree that we can never fully understand. And that as one who loves us to that degree, that He desires to move in our life. And so, Lord, would you just make these things clear? So maybe your response today is just to simply write down the things that God is calling you to do. Maybe, maybe for you it is that altar of prayer. And you want this to be a moment in your life where you can look back on you and say, you know what, that was the day. That was the day. I, just, I stopped caring about what everyone was going to think. 
I stop caring about, you know, you know what, what, if I go to the altar, are they going to wonder if it's about this or if it's about this? And I just, I just followed what God was calling me to do, and I just knelt and prayed, and that was the moment that I truly gave it all to Him. In the clarity of the moment, I acted. Wherever you are today, I want to invite you to respond as we sing. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning at the end beginning at the end the God had three and one Father, Spirit and Son the Lion and lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Guys, can we turn off that track? You know, as we're, as we're concluding today, I was challenged by the words of, of Pastor Jim Simbola the other day. And he said, you know, as we're calling our churches to, to be men and women of prayer, maybe, maybe we should just put that as an example. And he said, pa- pastors, maybe, maybe you need to stop preaching and just allow the church to pray. <laughs> if we truly believe that it's through the power of prayer that things happen. And so I just wanted to, can we, can we just do that today? And and maybe if, if one or two of you want to want to pray, that you would just pray. And I know it's an unorthodox, and I know that maybe it's awkward, silent. You know what? That's okay. But I just want to ask for the next few minutes that if you feel led to pray, that you would just pray and ask God to move in our, in our church, in our community. We have so many needs that are, are needed to be prayed for. You know, we have a community that's, that's hurting. We have the community of Oak Grove that's, that's, that's still hurting. It's fresh. It's, it's, it's something raw. They need prayers for comfort. We, we, in Birmingham, we have a, a young girl that's, that's still missing. I want to pray that God would bring that young girl home. We, we have families in our community that they're battling with addiction, and they've got children that are battling with addiction, and, it's, and they don't just need a pat on the back, and it's going to be okay. They just need God to move in their life. We've got families that, that they're on the verge of divorce, and, and, and it's going to affect everything. They need God to come into those moments. And so, so as we conclude today, can we just bow our heads in prayer? And if you'd like to pray, I just want to invite you to pray. And I'll close us as we, as we do, do that this, this morning. Let's pray.